1976, the St. Louis players, to a man, believed this would be the best Cardinal team ever. Instead, it became the best ever to miss the NFL playoffs, as a third straight division title eluded them. In a season that began with an exotic trip to a faraway land and ended on the outside looking in, St. Louis won a half dozen games in the final seconds and once again were known as the Cardiac Cards, the most exciting team in professional football. For eight days in August, the Cardinals experienced the ultimate road trip, a visit to Tokyo for a preseason game with the Chargers. The Japanese journey gave the St. Louis organization the rare opportunity to introduce pro football to the Japanese and to witness firsthand their noted dedication and passion for sports of all kinds, on every level, for every age group. Uh, so, uh, would you introduce uh, your name and your position? My name is Jim Hart. I play quarterback. Uh, Jim Hart. Jim Hart. -san. Position. Quarterback. Quarterback. Uh, Dan Deerdorf, offensive tackle. You hit him with the hands. You've got your hips up underneath you, and then you could, you're in a position where you can start looking for the ball here. When he goes like that, you can move right with it. You can move right with it. Don't get too much weight. When you, when we, we pass a lot, we throw the ball a lot, so we have to be in the same stance every time. You can't let the defensive lineman know whether you're going to drop back for the pass or whether you're going to fire out at him. So use the same stance every time. I'd be an offensive lineman over here. <laughs> you know that. You'd be the biggest offensive lineman they had. They've been doing this for a couple hours. I think we better make sure that our coaches don't get out here to see this. <laughs> yeah. Look at that. They even run up to the line of scrimmage. <laughs> that oh. makes my heart skip a beat. Ooh, did you just... Oh, my God. The culmination of the visit was the game itself. A Monday night meeting with the Chargers in Tokyo's Korakuen Stadium. The experiment of introducing the NFL brand of football to a different culture was an unqualified success, for the Japanese were an enthusiastically receptive audience. So, a little bit of history was made on the humid night of August 16th, when having overcome jet lag and disrupted practice schedules, the Cardinals defeated the Chargers in the first ever NFL game outside the North American continent. The end result was a very good time for the team and a lot of goodwill between peoples of a different nation. The unique experience was ably summed up by the Cardinals Charlie Davis and Jim Hart. I liked it, but I'm ready to go home. I'm ready to go home. I enjoyed it. Quite an experience. I mean, quite an experience. Just look at it, man. How many people we made happy tonight. And I'm happy because uh, I'm going home tomorrow. <laughs> When asked how many touchdowns his team would score against the Seattle Seahawks, St. Louis receiver Mel Gray couldn't keep a secret. And why not? For very few offensive teams possess the balance and versatility of the St. Louis Cardinals. Terry Metcalf is a one-man ground game whose enormous talent nearly overshadows that of his running mate, NFC rushing champion Jim Otis. Quarterback Jim Hart is a proven winner, and Cardinal receiving is deep to the last man, in this case, rookie Pat Tilly. Against Seattle, St. Louis jumped to a 20-point lead. But Jack Patera's Seahawks have acquired a reputation as a come-from-behind football team, 
a reputation they upheld with class against the Cardinals. Rookie Jim Zorn's 72-yard hookup with Sam McCullum narrowed the Cardinal lead to 13. Later, the scrambling left-hander demonstrated the ability to improvise that has earned him a starting job in the NFL. Jim Zorn is the unchallenged hero of Pacific Northwest football fans, but despite his heroic efforts, few expansion teams have ever won their first NFL game. The comeback fell short. Opening day, the team participated in another first, the inaugural for Seattle in the Kingdom. Jim Otis and Terry Metcalf each rushed for more than 100 yards as the Big Red amassed over 450 yards total offense. But the explosion was needed as the Seahawks put plenty of points on the board themselves. The outcome was in doubt up to the final play, but the Cardinals had victory number one, 30 to 24. In the home opener, the defense atoned for its initial performance by recovering four fumbles and intercepting three Packer passes in a 29 to nothing shutout of Green Bay. But in St. Louis, the Cardinals opened with five field goals and a 15 to nothing lead. While the birds were footloose, the Packers were performing like foot stools. Even this apparent Packer score by Ken Payne was called out of bounds, and a victory boogaloo became a symbolic bump and bobble. The Packer pattern of ineptitude was consistent throughout the afternoon, and each new disaster spelled opportunity for the Cardinals, who flashed to an easy 29 to nothing win. A week later, the defense completely collapsed, making Don Coriel's return to San Diego an unpleasant one. The Chargers handed the Cards their first loss of the season, a surprising 43 to 24 route. came back to lead 10 to 6 on a pass from Jim Hart to J.V. Kane. But as they say of Margaret Mitchell's book, Gone with the Wind, that's all she wrote. Back home against the Giants, the team regained its winning ways, but had to go to the very last play of the game to ensure a narrow six-point victory. But Cardinal fans can't let their team rest, for St. Louis must keep on chugging to keep pace with Dallas in the NFC East, a task made simpler last week by a genuine rarity, a Cardinal defensive touchdown. Mike Sensabaugh's 35-yard interception return set the tone for the entire afternoon as both teams turned in alert, opportunistic, heads-up, defensive play. But New York's cunning defense could only outwit the Cardinals for so long. With Jim Otis sidelined, Jim Hart turned to his replacement, number 34, Steve Jones. And the fourth-year fullback responded with 85 yards rushing and two touchdowns. Enough to keep the Giants winless. Week five brought the Philadelphia Eagles, and that always means a knockdown, dragged out, hard hitting battle between the division rivals. The 
big play was a Jim Hart bomb to Mel Gray. But the big story was the depth displayed by the running attack. Four different backs scored touchdowns as the Cardinals won by their biggest margin of the year. In St. Louis, the end zone was clearly in view, but the path toward it was a treacherous one for both the Cardinals and the Philadelphia Eagles. The game was even into the second quarter, but then, like a pool hall hustler who's been trifling with his victim too long, the Cardinals showed their game and outscored the Eagles 33 to seven. We're not as good as we should be, said Cardinal coach Don Coriel, but we're getting better every week. Unfortunately, the Cardinals must get a lot better. Next came the Cowboys, undefeated at this juncture. But Jim Hart riddled the Dallas defense for 346 yards and two long touchdowns to Mel Gray. Gray's great day was not unexpected. What was, was the performance of the defense, which despite the shotgun formation, sacked Roger Staubach four times. In their finest moment of the entire season, St. Louis's much maligned defense served up an old-fashioned goal line stand, stopping Dallas on Mike Dawson's tackle on fourth down from the one. The win over the Cowboys signaled the development of a defense that improved so much it gave up more than three touchdowns only once, despite playing one of the toughest schedules in the league. One guy you never stick your tongue out at is Dallas quarterback Roger Staubach, whose tidy set of statistics has buried five straight opponents. Against the St. Louis Cardinals, Staubach and tight end Billy Joe Dupree meshed so perfectly it appeared the Cowboys were running skeleton drills on the practice field. However, the Cardinals were not unduly worried, for if Dallas has the faculty for producing the home run play, they also historically have the facility for allowing them. The Cowboys' deep defense was said to be soft, and Mel Gray, number 85, turned it into jello. In wide receiver Gray and setback Terry Metcalf, number 21, St. Louis has a one-two punch unrivaled in pro football. It was Metcalf's ability to evaporate into the secondary and behind Cowboy linebackers that produced a 14 to 10 lead for the Cardinals. Ultimately, the difference in the game was the Cowboys' failure to cash in on this opportunity created by Charlie Waters, number 41. Instead of reaping a touchdown, or at the very least a field goal, Dallas came up dry, while St. Louis engineered a 98-yard drive that ended in a lady luck touchdown by Gray. Gray rubbed a spike into Dallas' wounds and seemed to put some ginger in their offense. Operating behind the shotgun, Staubach spit out a final touchdown to Drew Pearson. Even though they managed to make the Cardinals bleed a little at the end, it was the Cowboys who died with their cleats on and lost their first game 21-17. to On a Monday night in Washington, St. Louis played amid a torrential downpour of rain and footballs. The Cardinals set an NFL record with nine fumbles, eight of them lost. They gained a measure of revenge by sacking Redskin quarterbacks eight times and outpassing their opponents with an incredible 206 to 23 yard edge. But statistics meant little on the muddy field and in the fourth quarter, one unbelievable play cost the cards the ball game and first place in the NFC's Eastern Division.
opening kickoff provided some weird entertainment when San Francisco forgot to cover the ball. St. Louis recovered, and Jim Hart quickly exploited the error for a Cardinal touchdown. It was the first salvo in a seesaw battle that featured two superb lines goring at each other head to head. Despite Terry Metcalf's touchdown, St. Louis trailed in the final period. Then Pro Football's most explosive passing partnership tied the game with a 77-yard bomb. Mel Gray, playing with a broken nose, sent the game into overtime. And there the sun set on the San Francisco 49ers. Jim Otis, a bull among the butterflies in the cards' backfield, carried six consecutive times to put the ball in point-blank field goal range. It only remained for the Iceman, Jim Bakken, to calmly win the game. The cardiac cards had won a thrilling overtime victory in a game in which it was a shame there had to be a loser. The Cardinals' big win started a streak of three games, all of them settled and won in the frantic final seconds of play. In St. Louis, the Cardinal 49er game offered a classic heavyweight punch-out, the irresistible force meeting the immovable object. Although Don Coriel's Cardinals possess a suspect defense, there is nothing suspicious about their offense, a unit laden with all pros. The problem for Coriel was a 49er defense led by number 86 Cedric Hardman that had not allowed a touchdown for 12 consecutive quarters. Facing a 49er rush line that sacked quarterbacks a league high 37 times was the biggest, possibly the best, and certainly the meanest offensive line in pro football. You need a team of wolf men to stop this front four. There is young tackle Jimmy Webb. The bookend veterans at the flanks, Tommy Hard and Cedric Hardman. And finally, rookie tackle Cleveland Elam, number 72. This season, the St. Louis line vowed that their quarterback would never have to have his uniform laundered. And they have almost lived up to that boast since Jim Hart has been sacked but five times in seven games. Many claim that the Cardinals hold on every play, a penalty that this season the referees have had no trouble calling. For Monty Clark, victory meant retention of first place in the NFC West. Victory hinged on Jim Plunkett's leadership as San Francisco met St. Louis in the NFL Game of the Week. Rookie return specialist Paul Hofer and Anthony Leonard would have been wiser to fair catch the opening kickoff and let it go completely unattended. This incredible blunder resulted in a cardinal recovery by Jerry Latin, number 32. And since you can't advance a kickoff, it was first and goal for St. Louis at the eight-yard line. The 49er defense leads the NFL in both scoring and yardage allowed, but it would prove a stern test indeed to stem the adrenaline that had pumped into the Cardinals after such early good fortune. San Francisco proved invulnerable to the run, but not to the pass, as a third down screamer by Jim Hart connected with tight end J.V. Kane for a touchdown. Good teams convert good luck into points, and another look reveals how lucky Jim Hard was. A power rush by Cedric Hardman, number 86, 
almost handed Hart his head. But instead of a sack, Hardman sucked only air as Hart drilled Kane in the numbers. St. Louis led 7 to nothing and set about to contain a 49er offense that is decidedly second fiddle to its defense. Under Jim Plunkett, the attack seems to bog down and die from self-inflicted wounds. In the first period, the Hurts were real, not imaginary, as the stunning, looping, big red defense converged at the point of attack. The big question mark has been Jim Plunkett, who some say is still shell-shocked from his years with the New England Patriots. Plunkett's touch completely deserted him in a first period that saw him complete one pass for eight yards. Of the Cardinals' big play attack, with practically no blocking, the tiny sprinter came within a stride of burning a hole through the middle of the 49er defense. The secret of containing St. Louis rests on the ability of defenses to shut off the home run to Gray and deny the open field to gifted Terry Metcalf, number 21. Only once did Metcalf escape the clutches of this tenacious defense, and on that occasion the play was blunted by a holding penalty. With Grace as our resilient team, and they bounced back when Dell Williams crashed in for a score to cap an 80-yard San Francisco drive. Most teams use crucifixes and wolfbane to ward off Conrad Dobler and Tom Banks, the Bella Lugosi and Lon Chaney of the Big Red Line. But other than an occasional bust-out play, there was no bite in the Cardinal attack. Reason for book touchdown by Dell Williams that gave the 49ers a 13 to 7 lead. Williams gained over 100 yards in the first half, and a repeat of the score reveals the speed and moves of number 24. Most at will, it was anything but a safe lead. St. Louis, in fact, came right out and moved to that score. Jim Otis' fumble was recovered by Cardinal tight end J.V. Kane. As we shall see later, a Jim Otis fumble is rare indeed. And even this one hadn't hurt the Cardinals, who now began to exploit the 49er flanks with swing passes to their backs. After Steve Jones carried a heart dart inside the 30, Terry Metcalf finally got free, beating Skip Vanderbunt for a catch and the 49ers secondary for a touchdown. Swing passes proved to be the key to the drive, and on a repeat we can see that number 64, Bob Young, and his line mates were getting hard the time he needed to wait for his other receivers to clear an area and get a running back isolated on a linebacker. For the Cardinals, the touchdown meant a 14 to 13 lead, and for Metcalf, a chance to let out the frustration. First, a 43-yard Plunkett to Jim Lash connection. Set up a one-yard Williams plunge as San Francisco reclaimed the lead. With another look, we can see what a fine catch Lash made, reaching up to snatch the ball at the last instant. If he hadn't caught the ball, it would have hit him right between the eyes. San Francisco had a sudden 20 to 14 lead, but just as suddenly, on the next play from scrimmage, in fact, St. Louis came back. Mel Gray's 77-yard sprint that tied the game at 20 had the fans on their feet. But upfield, a very calm Jim Hart looked like it was just another Sunday stroll. Perhaps bombs away to Gray are getting kind of ho-hum to Hart. So return Jim Bakken's kick back to him. 
So by virtue of both teams failing on a point after the score was tied, with San Francisco with Steve Mickemeyer, who had a 23-yarder to give San Francisco the lead with two minutes to go in the game. But Mickemeyer missed, and the 49ers had failed to deliver the knockout punch. Though both teams had one more possession in regulation time, neither could score, and the game went into overtime with the two teams tied at 20. Anthony Leonard returned the punt to the 49er 45, but on the play, the Cardinals got the game-breaking break when Steve Jones recovered his fumble. Body Clark could only hope that the splendid San Francisco defense could do it again. By now, they were aware of the Cardinal plan to run Otis, Otis, and more Otis, and they forced St. Louis into a third and absolutely necessary one yard at the 49er 34. Sure enough, Jim Otis got the call. And though everyone in Bush Stadium knew who would carry the ball, Jim Otis ran for 23 yards. Otis had now carried seven times in the overtime for 47 yards, and number 35 just kept right on coming. Getting a pat on the back even before he arose, Jim Otis still had enough left to help a teammate off the ground. So why not let him carry a couple more times? The result was that Jim Otis carried on 10 of 11 St. Louis snaps and literally carried the Cardinals on his back to the San Francisco four-yard line. By now, he was exhausted, and it was time to receive a helping hand. It was fitting that center Tom Banks should offer it, for those unpublicized men in the pits appreciate it most when a running back makes the most of their sacrifices in the interior line. When a Jim Otis has the kind of day he had, it makes all the grunts, groans, bangs, and bruises with little acclaim worth the effort. Six minutes, 42 seconds into overtime, a game that had lived up to its advanced billing came down to a 21-yard field goal try by Jim Bakken. As he had done so many, many times, Jim Bakken made the kick that won the game, this time 23-20 over the San Francisco 49ers. The win brought the Cardinals record to 6-2, one game behind Dallas in the highly competitive NFC East Division. In the St. Louis locker room, there was no raucous celebration, for there is a tough schedule still to be completed. There was instead a shared moment of a job well done, an appreciation of each other's talents. 49er head coach Monty Clark perhaps put it most succinctly, Aside from a couple mistakes, I thought we outplayed them, he said, but they are a championship-type team. Two more contenders played one of the season's strangest games last Sunday in St. Louis. The 49ers goof gave the Cardinals the ball inside the 10, and as San Francisco coach Monty Clark said later, that was the game right there. J.V. Kane's score gave St. Louis the lead after just one and a half minutes of play. But the 49ers' league-leading defense allowed no more Cardinal scoring in the first half. Meanwhile, Jim Plunkett was handing off to Delvin Williams, number 24. And Williams ran wild. Del Williams rushed for 194 yards and the two touchdowns, which put the 49ers ahead at the half, 13 to seven. In the second half, the NFL's best pass protectors gave Jim Hart the time he needed. Terry Metcalf's score had the Cardinals ahead again, 14 to 13 after three quarters. But on the very next series, Jim Plunkett and the 49ers came right back.
newly acquired Jim Lash, number 87, made the big play. But then Jim Hart and Mel Gray made an even bigger play. Mel Gray's 77-yarder meant sudden death overtime, which belonged exclusively to the Cardinals' sometime forgotten fullback, Jim Otis. Otis carried on 10 of the 11 offensive plays run in the overtime period, thereby setting up the game winner by Jim Bakken. For the Cardinals, who had lost in Washington six nights earlier, it was an important victory because it put them one game ahead of the Redskins and just one game behind the Cowboys in the torrid NFC East. In Philadelphia, with Mel Gray and Terry Metcalf out with injuries, Jim Otis and rookie Wayne Morris sparked the offense. But ahead by only three points, and with the Eagles driving for a score, the cardiac cards prevailed with only 11 seconds showing. In Philadelphia, the headlines announced a return grudge match. But in a game dominated by hard hitting, a calculated risk produced the game's first points. On third down and short yardage, Mike Barilla and Charlie Smith caught the Cardinals napping. But this contest would be decided in the pit. Bill Berge and the improved Eagle defense against Jim Otis and that nasty Cardinal offensive line. Bergie and the Eagles won the early rounds, but Otis and the Cardinal front just never stopped coming. And as the final stanza began to unfold, clearly St. Louis had gained the upper hand. Otis finished with 115 yards, and his fourth quarter bursts made possible a Jim Bakken field goal and a three-point Cardinal advantage. Then, the Eagles made that one fatal mistake. Dave Hampton's unfortunate fumble cost the Eagles a chance to tie and go into overtime. In a contest as balanced as this one, and over the course of a season for that matter, a handful of crucial mistakes often separate the winners from the also rans Jim Otis and the Cardinals deserved to win, but somehow Bill Berge's Eagles did not deserve to lose. Next in Los Angeles, things got even tighter. Down 21 to 6, St. Louis staged a torrid second half comeback. Led by Jim Hart, who hit 13 of 16, eight of them to Ike Harris. Hart's sensational passing performance brought the Cardinals to within a single point late in the fourth quarter. Then, in a typical Cardinal caper, the Big Red offense rolled downfield. And with four seconds remaining, Jim Bakken attempted to win the game. The dramatic two-point victory brought the St. Louis season record to eight wins and only two losses. Cardinal Cool in the hottest situations is a matter of heart. In the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum last year, the Rams knocked St. Louis out of the playoffs. Number 11, Pat Hayden, was not there last year. But last week, he and Harold Jackson made it look like the same kind of game. The Rams led 14-6 at the half. And then, the second half kickoff really put the Cardinals in a bind. Cullen Bryant, the 235-pound kick returner, put the Rams ahead 21-6. And then Jim Hart finally got his offense in gear. In the second half, 
hard hit on 13 of 16 passes, and the cardiac card scored 24 points, just enough to catch the Rams at the gun 30 to 28 for their third consecutive hair-raising victory. With a record of 8-2, and two, St. Louis hosted Washington for a rematch they had to win. The Cardinals attacked early, but the Redskins went ahead in the third quarter. Then, with 45 seconds left in the game, the Big Red stormed downfield. But from the Washington 20, with a sure shot at winning, all four heart passes failed to connect in the end zone. The cardiac cards had lived up to their nickname, but lost a crucial game they thought they would win. Four days Big Red Attack continued to misfire in a battle with the Cowboys for the division lead. When Hart's pass from his own end zone barely missed J.V. Kane, the Cardinals were forced to punt and the Dallas special teams made the key play of the game. The blocked punt gave Dallas a 19-7 lead. But with less than two minutes left, the Cardinal attack finally ignited. With time running out, St. Louis got the ball back for one more try. Faced with fourth and ten and a minute remaining, Jim Hart hit a high-pressure pass to Ike Harris for the vital first down. Fifty-four seconds showing, and Hart perfectly placed the ball into the arms of Mel Gray at the Dallas 13. But here, 13 yards and 48 seconds away from victory, the Cardinal comeback died. Three in-zone incompletions, two of them controversial calls in which St. Louis felt interference should have been charged, nailed down a bitter defeat this Thanksgiving day. For the second time in five days, the team's last-minute lifestyle had betrayed them. And it now seemed certain that not only a division title, but perhaps a berth in the playoffs, too, would elude the St. Louis Cardinals. Millions of turkeys across the land, the St. Louis Cardinals could become just one more dead bird in their Thanksgiving Day game in Dallas against the Cowboys. A St. Louis loss and a Washington sweep of their remaining games would cut the cards out of the playoffs. But don't ever count the cardiac cards out. Week after week, they stop the hearts of their faithful and keep fans, players, and even coaches kicking. Their game against the Cowboys would mark the eighth time in 12 starts that the outcome of a St. Louis game was in doubt until the game's final play. Although Dallas leads the division, the Cowboys haven't exactly been blowing people away of late. Since the onset of Roger Staubach's injured pinky, they have narrowly beaten the Giants and the Bills. And last week, Dallas lost to the Falcons. If the Cowboys don't get on their horses today, the division will be up for grabs once more. On the game's first play from scrimmage, Gray paid for his indiscretion. On a seemingly harmless play, Gray's arm was injured and he was forced to sit out the remainder of the first half. That march was sparked by two receptions good for 20 yards to number 83, Pat Tilly, who came into the game when Gray was injured. Tilly, a rookie who went to Louisiana Tech, the same school that produced Baltimore's burner Roger Carr, has great hands and has been doing an excellent job filling in for Gray, who has missed a lot of action recently due to a broken nose. In this game, his two catches on the first and second plays of the second quarter got the St. Louis passing attack rolling. Three hard completions for 42 yards brought the ball to the four-yard line. 
From where Steve Jones followed number 64, guard Bob Young right over Leroy Jordan for the touchdown. But on the play, the Cardinals were called for holding, nullifying the touchdown. Can you guess who the guilty party was? Number 88, J.V. Kane was called for holding. But his penalty was quickly offset when on the very next play, number 42, Randy Hughes, was called for interfering with Ike Harris. Instead of third and 12, St. Louis had a first and 10 from the 10. And two plays later, Jones reclaimed his touchdown. This time crashing over number 43, Cliff Harris, for the score. Jones, a 200-pounder, is often used when the Cardinals get in close. And his goal line power run had brought another St. Louis scoring drive to a successful conclusion. When things looked darkest for the Cardinals, the fortunes of the game suddenly changed. On a rollout to his right, Roger Staubach fumbled the ball, which St. Louis recovered on their own 32. The Cardinal offense was presented with another opportunity, and for the first time since early in the second quarter, they were up to the task, as Jim Hart began a passing barrage that took them to the Dallas 24. Mel Gray, back in action after being injured on the first play of the game, met with some out-of-bounds resistance from defender Benny Barnes. But the Cardinal air attack was clicking at last. However, when Hart passed high to Terry Metcalf over the middle, the little setback was unable to reel the ball in, and the Cardinals' promising drive faced a third and ten challenge. Metcalf was replaced by more sure-handed Wayne Morris, and despite the fact the halfback from Southern Methodist is a rookie, Hart went to him in this crucial situation. Morris made the catch, but number 25, Aaron Kyle, came up fast to take him down five yards short of the first down marker. Because of Kyle's quickness, St. Louis was faced with fourth and five from the Dallas 19. A field goal was of no help now, so the Cardinals had to go for the touchdown. The Dallas defense braced for the fourth down attempt. Armed with the knowledge that with Terry Metcalf on the bench and not playing particularly well, Hart's number one target had to be Mel Gray, decidedly off his game so far today. Despite the certainty of what was coming, Hart hit Gray over the middle, where a missed forearm shiver by Mark Washington gave Gray a chance to flash his speed. Hard to Gray partnership had finally exploded by combining for a clutch touchdown in a crucial spot. St. Louis now trailed by five with less than two minutes remaining in the game. The chance as red shirts poured in on every down and forced Dallas to give up the ball. But after three straight incompletions, Hart was in a hole. Fourth and ten from his own 37 as he went back for a pass he had to complete. Somehow, Ike Harris had worked his way free and clear as he came across the middle for the vital first down. And on the next play, Hart placed a beauty into the arms of Mel Gray at the right sideline. The perfect pass covered 27 yards all the way to the Dallas 13. And in typical fashion, the last minute momentum belonged to St. Louis. From the 13 with 48 seconds showing, Hart saw J.V. Kane open in the end zone, but Dallas quickly recovered. On the near-miss touchdown, Hart saw Kane streaking into the open, pumped once, and was forced to throw off balance. If the pass had more on it, the Dallas defenders wouldn't have been able to converge on their collision course with J.V. Kane. Kane pleaded interference to no avail, but St. Louis still had 41 seconds to score. On second down, Tom Henderson, number 56, playing in the middle of a prevent defense, made another very important play using his great speed to stop Terry Metcalf at the eighth.
Third down now and only 17 seconds left in the game as Hart calmly took his place over center Tom Banks. As they usually do, the Cardinals' great offensive line gave Hart plenty of time to wait for a receiver to come open. But Cliff Harris slapped the ball away from J.B. Kane. The game and perhaps the Cardinals' chances for making the playoffs for the third straight year rested on one final play from the Dallas eight. One last go for the cardiac cards against the doomsday defense. In a heart-stopping last-second goal line stand, the Dallas Cowboys had prevailed over the cardiac Cardinals, and sweet victory was theirs. Hero Tom Henderson made certain Mel Gray realized that fact. With two games remaining, both with teams within their division, Dallas is yet to be assured of a playoff berth, yet alone a division title. That's how tight the three-way fight in the NFC Eastern Division is. And the powerful Baltimore Colts were next on the schedule. Right from the start, the Cardinals were on the attack against the Colts. And on this bright December day, a capacity crowd at Bush Stadium was treated to an old-fashioned barn burner. An aerial fireworks display between the two best pure passers in professional football. Even on this day, the Cardinals' high-powered air attack had to take a backseat to an inspired Big Red defense, which caused four Baltimore fumbles and a game-saving interception by Ken Reeves on the final play. The exciting triumph over the Colts kept the Cardinals' playoff hopes alive going into the final game of the season. West Memorial Stadium, St. Louis, Missouri, Saturday pass, big game, the Colts against the Big Red, and Jimmy Hart with the score tied 7-7, hits Terry Metcalf, now look at that, what balance, he never went down, touchdown, the Cards take a 14-7 lead, now the score is 14-10, the Cards threaten, and Steve Jones gets the handoff from Jimmy Hart. The young man from Duke bursts through. Four yards. Touchdown. That made it 21 to 10. Then midway in the fourth quarter, the score is 21 to 17. And the Colts are driving. But look at John Zuck. Zucker. Bert Jones from the blind side. Jones never knew what hit him. The ball captured by Charlie Davis. And that stopped the Colt drive. And that set up a St. Louis field goal, making a 24 to 17. Still the Colts tried to come back. Jones leading his team. Now this throw, out of nowhere, Kenny Reeves. And this young man is some secondary. He was great with Atlanta. Got traded to New Orleans. Wound up with the Big Red, and they don't regret it. That stopped the Colts. And so the St. Louis Cardinals, in a must-win game, Kept their playoff hopes alive, 24 to 17. This week, Burt Jones, the NFL's top-ranked quarterback, led the NFL's top-ranked offense with passes like this one to Roger Carr. The Baltimore Colts have scored 359 points so far this season, the most in the NFL, and that is due in good part to the classic rifle belonging to the Jones boy. This touchdown by number 87, tight end Raymond Chester, brought the Colts close in the third quarter. 
but Baltimore could get no closer, partly because of some new red-dogging defenses, which the Cardinals' coaches devised especially for Burt Jones and the Colts. The main difference in the game was that the Cardinals suffered only one turnover while taking five away from the usually sure-handed Colts. Baltimore has been the league's best pass rushing team for the past two seasons. But this quality was nullified by the great wall of St. Louis, allowing Jim Hart and the NFC's top ranked offense enough time to hit for big plays through the air. Number 88, third-year tight end J.V. Kane came up with several clutch catches for the Big Red. The game's biggest play was the kind everyone has come to expect from Mr. Wonderful, Terry Metcalf. The Cardinals had to win, and they did win 24 to 17. St. Louis was still in the playoff picture and hoping for some help this weekend from the Dallas Cowboys in their game against the Washington Redskins. Last week in the Jersey Meadowlands, giant players and fans alike wanted a win to ensure a job for popular coach John McVay. Unfortunately for the ex-WFL coach, the Giants' opponents were the explosive St. Louis Cardinals, who faced a do-or-die situation. St. Louis needed a win here and a Washington defeat in Dallas to qualify for the NFL playoffs. But it was New York who made the game's first big play when Cardinal running star Jim Otis fumbled and Brad Van Pelt carried it all the way to the one. This prompted the Giants' touchdown and a lead they didn't relinquish until late in the game. It appeared the Giants might be successful in saving the job for McVeigh, who replaced Bill Arnsbarger, and instilled a new spirit and confidence. But McVeigh's hopes for an upset vanished when Terry Metcalf provided the turning point on a punt return. So now, the Giants had been in control, but the big play by the little superstar ignited St. Louis. With just six minutes remaining, from a full house backfield and the Giants dug in on their one, the constant pounding the Cardinals' great forward wall had been inflicting all afternoon finally took its toll. Steve Jones' second touchdown of the day gave the Cardinals and Coach Don Coriel the win they so badly needed, 17 to 14. That it had been a struggle was a tribute to the rehabilitation job of John McVay, whose uncertain future will soon be decided by the Giants' brass. St. Louis had accomplished their mission. Now it was up to Dallas to defeat Washington as Coriel's cardiac cards went to the locker room to await the outcome of that crucial game. In New York, the team trademark of nerve-wracking, nail-biting struggles continued as the card seemed flat and the Giants led. Then a Metcalf punt return ignited the spark. With six minutes remaining, from the full house backfield, Steve Jones scored the touchdown St. Louis had to have. With the narrow three-point victory, the team now had to depend on Dallas to defeat Washington later that afternoon. St. Louis had won its last two games, 10 in all, and having accomplished everything they could for the 1976 season, the Cardinals went to the locker room to await their fate. <laughs> 